What's Up, Doc Mike, Public Health on Call, by Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Today's topic for February 23, 2021. COVID-19 Research Update, Schools. Thank you, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Welcome to Season 3 of Public Health on Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, I speak to three scientists who are part of the novel coronavirus research compendium, an effort at Johns Hopkins to review new scientific findings relevant to the pandemic. The compendium is online at ncrc.jhsph.edu. That's ncrc.jhsph.edu. First, I speak to Dr. Nicholas Wada about a paper published in Lancet Infectious Diseases related to how the coronavirus is transmitted in schools in the United Kingdom. Then I speak to Dr. Cherie Schwartz about a paper published in Clinical Infectious Diseases examining children's role in the household transmission of the coronavirus. Finally, I talked to a PhD student, Greg Rosen, about another study in Clinical Infectious Diseases examining what happened when Israel opened schools with few precautions back in the spring. Let's listen. Dr. Wada, thanks so much for joining me. Tell me what paper uh, you want to talk about. Uh, thanks for having me back. Um, given the uh, tremendous importance, both you know, from a public health perspective and from a social and economic perspective of school reopenings, there's been a surprising lack of solid evidence on either side of, of in terms of what's actually been happening in schools and how much they've contributed to community transmission. So this study was a comprehensive look at schools in England during the reopening, the first reopening of schools during the summer half term of 2020 from June 1st to July 17th. And what particularly did they look at about these reopenings? It was a national um, perspective surveillance program where schools had to report any uh, suspected or confirmed cases of COVID-19 in their schools. And then Public Health England would then decide whether or not to send a team, a local team, to investigate further. So essentially, they were characterizing infections within schools and defined by students who or staff members who were physically present in the location when they tested positive and looked at the occurrence of outbreaks within uh, within schools subsequent to those initial cases. And was the research conducted by Public Health England? It was, that's right. And so what did they find? So they found a surprisingly low number of uh, transmission events that occurred in schools. Now, perhaps it's not so surprising since levels of community transmission were very low in England uh, during that time period. This was after the initial lockdown and after the initial peak of of COVID-19. So schools were not fully open. They were reopened for a select number of years for early years settings, which were equivalent to preschools for kids under five, two primary years, years one and six of primary, equivalent to four and five-year-olds and and 10 and 11-year-olds, and some secondary, uh, a limited number of secondary students came back. But since they came back for a shorter period of time and there were fewer of those students, the authors really restricted their conclusions to the early and primary Mm -hmm. schools. And how rare were the transmission events that they saw in the school? So there are about a million kids uh, on average per day in school and over half a million staff members. And for the six weeks that they looked at, uh, there were only 343 cases with 130 of those in kids and 213 in staff members. And those were cases that they believe originated in the school or those were cases that were detected of someone that was in the school? They couldn't answer the question of where the cases arose, Mm -hmm. but they were detected um, in either students or staff members while while the student or the staff member was physically present in the school. And in terms of actual outbreaks or clusters, it sounds like they couldn't have seen that many if there were so few cases. 
That's right. So about 64% of the events were single cases, and there were 55 total outbreaks, With uh, and the average number of secondary transmissions per outbreak was just one, um, with a maximum of six um, for a student-initiated outbreak and 12 for a staff member-initiated outbreak. So I understand that there were relatively few infections that were identified. Were there serious consequences of those infections? Well, none of the children were hospitalized for COVID-19. And I believe three staff members were hospitalized and one ended up dying. Um, The authors note that it appears that that staff member was infected by a household member who was in turn infected from the community and that that infection didn't arise from the school itself. So the situation was generally low levels of virus in the community, precautions being taken in schools, focus on younger grades, and very little transmission within the school detected. That's right. So classrooms were less than a quarter full, uh, less than a quarter of, of students overall were back in school during this time period. There were strict infection control measures and, and the community transmission was low. But that said, this is still in line with, with um, sort of what we've seen elsewhere in that schools did not appear to be a significant source of, of community transmission or the source of explosive outbreaks. And yet you said the surprising finding. So why, why were you surprised by it? Well, I think it was perhaps surprising at the time. It's surprising given, given the, the fears about school reopening. And I think now these, these results are, are, are less surprising. Um, but it's, it's probably still important to keep in mind that this, this answer is a, a very specific question with, with strong evidence. And as you broaden the scope of the questions you're asking, the evidence is a little bit more, more uncertain. You know, right. is this generalizable to circumstances with higher community transmission or older kids or fuller classrooms? So that's, it becomes more difficult to say. Got it. Well, thanks for walking me through the results. Sure. Thank you for having me. Dr. Schwartz, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. Uh, Tell me the study that you're interested in discussing. Thanks for having me, Josh. So I'm going to be discussing a meta-analysis to understand the role of children in household transmission. And a meta-analysis is just when multiple scientific findings are brought together and analyzed. So these researchers pulled in different sources of data to answer what kinds of questions? They were interested in asking whether kids are giving, uh, to what extent kids are giving, um, passing along the the virus to their parents, and to what extent kids are getting infected from um, parents who come home infected. And so how much data were the researchers able to cobble together to address those questions? They did a systematic review across the literature. There were about 43 studies um, that that were relevant, and they found 213 transmission clusters where there were at least two people within a household um, that were infected. Um, And these were data from across 12 countries. So one of these papers might have had, you know, five clusters they were reporting, and another paper might have had 10 clusters. And these researchers went out and tried to find as many papers as they could. In the end, they got over 200 clusters to try to answer the questions we talked about, whether kids are likely to be the cause of an infection in the household and whether they're, you know, how likely they are to get it if there's an adult who's infected. Exactly. Okay, what did they find? So they found that overall children were very unlikely to be the index case in the household, meaning the first person in the household that was identified as being infected and then went on to infect others. So that was only 4% of the time that the kids were the index case. It was a bit higher when they looked at only the index cases that were asymptomatic. That was closer to um, one in five of those uh, infection clusters that stemmed from the child. But for the most part, it seems that children weren't really the sources of household infections. They also found, however, that when they looked at to what extent children were being infected within the household clusters, that children were 40% less likely than the other adults in the household to be a secondary case. So just so I understand what you're saying, if there is an adult in the house who's sick, children are 40% less likely to pick up the coronavirus than say another adult in the house. Yes. And so does that give some credence to the idea that it might be uh, easier to open schools, for example, where kids you know, are there with, with appropriate precautions than say um, a bar or some place where there are going to be adults there, but um, maybe a little bit more susceptible to getting infected? 
I think that's right, that these data have um, have public health relevance for thinking about school reopenings. It seems like that, you know, as long as the guidelines in place are followed, that it, it seems that that should be relatively safe because it seems like they're unlikely to bring it home uh, to their families. Um, and it also probably has implications for vaccination prioritization, that kids and, would be lower prioritized. Right. And I guess, um, do you know whether the kids were in school with these clusters? Do we know that? Or were some of the kids in school? So that's one of the real challenges is, is that a lot of the data are going to come from earlier on in the pandemic when a lot of school settings were closed. So, you know, one does have to keep in mind that kids were being kept home during a lot of the periods for which data are available and so less likely to be exposed. So I think that is one of the key caveats of the data. Got it. So we're not maybe the, the find that first finding that they're less likely to bring it home is hard to answer because some of those kids might have been stuck at home anyway but that second finding that if there's you know a child in the house they're 40% less likely to get sick from an adult than an adult really does reflect something about the susceptibility to the virus yeah, I, th I think that's right and also just to say the data also don't say anything really about once a kid is sick whether or not they are more or less likely than adult to infect someone else. Got it. And uh, that's obviously an important question too. Well, I think this is uh, very interesting. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you. Greg Rosen, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Public Health On Call podcast. Tell me about the paper you're looking at this week. Thanks for having me, Josh. Uh, the paper I'm looking at today is a paper that was published in Clinical Infectious Diseases. And this paper attempted to measure the impact of school reopenings on uh, COVID-19 transmission in Israel in the late spring, early summer of 2020. Got it. What, um, what happened in Israel around that time? Sure. So in around May of 2020 is when uh, community transmission in Israel was lower than it had, you know, was at the lowest point it had been uh, since the start of the pandemic in March 2020. And so um, on March 3rd, 2020, uh, schools in Israel began to reopen. Um, and so what the authors essentially tried to do with this paper is to measure um, a number of COVID-19 transmission indicators. So they looked at test positivity. They looked at COVID-19 incidents or new cases, and they also looked at hospitalizations and death. And they compared trends in those indicators in the week before schools reopened and then in the two to three weeks after schools reopened to essentially compare the potential effect of school reopenings on those COVID-19 epidemic metrics. Got it. So they, they knew what was happening before they reopened schools and they wanted to see what would result. That's exactly right. And what happened? So the authors found, pretty unsurprisingly, that test positivity, which measures the proportion of people that are testing positive for COVID-19 over the total number of people testing, increased across pediatric and adult age groups. And they defined pediatric age groups as anyone under the age of 20. So test positivity increased um, after the reopening of schools, and COVID-19 incidents also increased across those age groups. What the authors also showed is that hospitalizations and deaths, however, did not increase in that two to three week window after schools were, were reopened. Uh, the authors reported that hospitalizations and deaths uh, began to sort of rise uh, later in the summer after a number of other uh, public health restrictions were eased, including um, the reopening of synagogues and easing of restrictions on larger social gatherings. So they were looking at overall test positivity and the total number of positive tests for the whole country. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly right. No, so they Not just for the kids in school or the adults in school. That's exactly right. And so uh, the reason for doing that uh, partially is that they were trying to look at the impact of school reopenings on community transmission. So they were using national ecological data. They were not using individual level data. How did they know that there wasn't something else that might have been driving the increase in infections during that time? Like maybe there was, you know, some big chess tournament or something, you know, that was totally unrelated to opening schools. How could you tell? That's exactly right, Josh. And it's almost impossible to tell with the data that they've used. The sort of conclusions that the authors draw is that because hospitalizations and deaths didn't really begin to rise until summer of 2020, is that they sort of suspect that these other um, 
easing of restrictions on large social gatherings is really what drove increases in other types of community transmission. But I don't think it's really a fair conclusion to draw that from the results that actually were shared by the authors for the reasons that you mentioned. There were schools virtually were reopened for only about a month um, at this time. So the school year in Israel ended in June of 2020. So schools were you know, open for about four weeks. Um, and so it's entirely possible that, you know, schools may have actually been driving multiple generations of COVID-19 transmission that were just simply not detected. So it's possible, but not proven by this paper, that when they opened schools in Israel, um, it led to more cases and greater positivity, which it's possible, but not proven, could have led to problems down the road. That's exactly right. When they opened schools, were there a lot of precautions taken during that month? So compared to some other countries, like in Western Europe, Israel actually, and the authors do mention this in the paper, Israel did not use what's called a cohort-based approach to school reopenings. So it's entirely possible that that many of the schools in Israel were still, you know, recommending public health mitigation measures. So, you know, recommending mask use, encouraging social distancing within schools. But the schools themselves did not use any sort of policies to sort of de-densify um, the number of kids in classrooms, for example. Um, in fact, there was one very large outbreak, uh, COVID-19 outbreak in a high school in Jerusalem that happened shortly after schools were reopened. And many scientists and epidemiologists sort of said that, you know, a reason that COVID-19 spread so easily in the high school in Israel was just because of how densely populated the schools continued to be in Israel. Uh, There also, importantly, were were not um, any sort of additional mitigation measures like we've seen elsewhere in parts of the United States and Western Europe in schools like, for instance, assigning one teacher to be, you know, assigned to one classroom or to make sure that students from classrooms didn't have interactions with students potentially from other classrooms. Got it. I mean, earlier I've discussed a paper from the United Kingdom, which showed that uh, with a lot of mitigation measures and relatively low community transmission, it was actually quite safe to reopen schools here in Israel without a lot of precautions being taken. It sounds like there might have actually been a problem, although the paper doesn't establish that definitively. That's that's absolutely right. It's very difficult to actually tell what you know pediatric uh, test positivity and and new cases were actually associated directly with school reopenings. This is national data, and so we don't know whether the the children that you know tested positive and were diagnosed with COVID nineteen were actually right. attending schools. Right, but it's certainly not reassuring. I mean, it sounds like it could have been a problem, and so it may prove to a certain extent that. What you do in the school really does matter for whether the virus is transmitted. I couldn't agree more. Well, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.